You know, LA County Board of Supervisors have declared this to be the month of world, um, like we should say, uh, elder abuse, I want to get that straight, elder abuse awareness month. And it's a really, really sad story. And again, they're looking for potentially more victims. But this guy, this suspect, is in custody. And it appears he worked at a U.S. bank that's inside a grocery store. We believe it's Albertsons in Valencia. I'm not sure exactly how long he was at that particular bank. Um, but he would get to know them personally as they came in often, find out about their families. Um, he would identify the ones that really needed help, whether they couldn't drive, they uh, were disabled for various reasons, and he would become extremely friendly. So friendly, L.A. County Sheriff's fraud and cybercrime detectives say Daniel Welsh would even buy groceries for some of his victims. He groomed them to be victims. 31-year-old Daniel Welsh worked as a bank teller inside a grocery store in the 23,800 block of Copper Hill Drive in Valencia. Little by little, detectives say Welsh stole $180,000 from two elderly female customers. It was initially pulled out of their account in one large withdrawal each. Um, and it was pulled out in cashier's checks of originally. And they're concerned there could be more victims, and they want to remind sons and daughters to be critical of who is befriending your elderly parents. You have to teach, especially the elder, who many of them grew up in an era of trusting people. Leave your doors unlocked, trust law enforcement, trust your, trust your priests, trust your, your neighbors. And unfortunately, a lot of our uh, people that we've trusted in the past have become uh, suspects. What we'd like people to do is if this was a bank teller that you banked with often and you knew him or he did your transactions, we check your accounts, make sure everything is the way it should be. As we said earlier, none of the victims knew they were victims. They didn't check their accounts regularly. They had no idea there was money missing. It wasn't until the bank actually went to them and advised them. Isn't that amazing? I mean, and that's really true for all of us. I mean, we really have to check our accounts. You assume everything is okay. But really important advice for, you know, to prevent elder abuse. Father's Day is coming up this Sunday. Many families, a detective say, will be getting together. So it's a good time to talk to your elderly parent or your grandparents if you look after them. And make sure that you never allow them to meet with a salesperson at home alone or if they're in a conv convalescent home. And also don't allow them to rush into filling out any paperwork. Definitely not signing anything into the they say like there's a deadline or something always make sure that you are there with them and be very careful who is befriending them who is doing favors why if you have any information if you think daniel walsh may have contacted you or somebody in your family make sure you call police immediately so what do you think could it happen to us yeah. sure it can yeah it, it we got to really be careful there's a lot of people out there wanting your money um What's neat about Elizabeth Espinosa after she did this uh, spot with me, she turned around and said, you know what, we should really do another case if you've got a good one. And we actually went out, interviewed a victim, and she made a show which was a half an hour long. It was called PBS SoCal. If you ever go on their site, you will see all their television programs. And one of them has me on there talking along with the Department of Consumer Affairs for the County of Los Angeles. And we highlight a case and talk about a lot of the things that we're going to talk about tonight. So before I start, I wanted to introduce uh, Sergeant Jackie Luna. She's the Elder Fraud Sergeant now at our unit, Fraud and Cyber Crimes, so LA County Sheriff's Headquarters Unit. And what we do is we handle the financial crimes that come in. And, and they're pretty con con well convoluted, complex, and what you're going to see tonight, and I'll explain why. Um, and then we have also real estate, which a lot of times we, we all agree that a lot of us, that as we get older, we've got real estate, we've got property with equity. And that's very vulnerable to us or to suspects to grab your, your property, okay? So I brought Ed Navarro. He's a volunteer. He works with us on the real estate task force. And uh, he, he also has an escrow office. So we, I think he works more for us for free than he does in his own business. But uh, it's really helpful. And I'll, we have a task force that's pretty unique. Uh, it's funded by whenever you've, you've real, uh, recorded a document for when you buy a house, you've ever noticed there's a fee that gets collected that's for law enforcement, that funds the task force, and that's what pays for our specialty, which is not an easy specialty. You have to really understand the real estate market, and you have to really know how to interview, you have to be a good fraud investigator, and you've also got to learn elder fraud. 
because of 30% of our cases are elder fraud based. So that's a big number. So we're going to talk a little bit about real estate tonight too. Yes. I have a question, sir. Do, can we know which uh, bank operate these, books, these uh, particular individuals that you show? No, you don't always know on people. What well, banks hire people just like any store. They hire people and they go on a resume or they go on a background check and they don't know when someone's maybe going to do something. And, and those things happen. Uh, you, you, we're going to talk about caregivers tonight and different individuals that come into your home and how we do need to make sure we're, who we're letting into our home. Yes, sir. Uh, some, some months back, my wife uh, and I heard a program news where they talked about, I'll call it the yes fraud, okay. where somebody calls you up and says, yes. your first name, yes. and you say, you right. automatically answer, right? right? And as soon as you do, they hang up because the phone somehow hooked up to your computer, and they're able to then go into your bank accounts, yes. or start purchasing, as they did in our case, uh, merchandise, things that I had never ordered, and luckily, when this happened to us, a few days after we had heard the thing, we said, okay, this is the yes fraud, I guess you'd call it, or I don't know. Right. Remember. And apparently the sheriff's farm knows about it, the news people did, but a lot of citizens, especially elderly people, did not know about it. No. For some reason. I There's guess. a lot of fraud that comes in yeah, through the telephones. And so the way it works, in our case, they, she immediately said, uh oh, it was like 11.30 at night, we're waiting for a doctor's call. And this person said, Rachel? And she said, yes, because that's an automatic reaction. Right. And it sounded like a voice I should recognize. Right. And so, luckily, we got immediately in touch with our Chase uh, Visa card company, a uh, lady in Manila. And they had already charged $3.29, <laughs> which they automatically. But a friend of mine, who was a judge, had $1,600. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Everybody can be victimized. Yeah. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. I'm glad you brought that up. So we're going to highlight some of those things tonight. I just wanted to ask you, fraud, yes. is, it, is it criminal? Yes. <coughs> forgery is criminal? Forgery is criminal, yeah. There's a lot of different sections that fall into criminal and fraud, grand theft, embezzlement, trick or device, cyber crimes. There's a identity theft. Uh, there's a whole myriad of, of crimes that fall under the category of fraud. So let me go ahead and launch this first video here I want to show you real quick. And this is what a lot of people think about the elderly, all right? This is kind of a misconception, but I like to show this cartoon because it kind of gets people thinking. And it's it's a it's a video gag they went out. Remember the old days? Uh, what, what was the picture that show it used to be? Uh, cam uh, camera or candid camera? Kind of the same idea. Um, what I want to move over this direction a little bit now, so I can kind of speak, because that's the last time I have to cue a video up, and I'll try to project my voice out for everybody here. What I'd like to do is, is first off, I want to let you know I'm with the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, and if you're aware of Los Angeles County, it's a very big county. And if you look at this, uh, all the, those are yellow areas are the, uh, what we call the unincorporated areas of the county, which the Sheriff's Department uh, patrols. And then there's those areas that are uh, green, which are contract cities that we p police for them. So in the city of Cerritos, we actually are contracted to be the police department. And I've worked in Cerritos Station. Uh, we've all had different assignments in different areas. And so I've worked at Compton. I've worked at Lakewood for 10 years. 
and then back to headquarters. I worked Lomita for a while. So I've had a lot of different areas in the county I've worked besides being in Detective Bureau uh, headquarters. So then you look at the other areas that are left over and you've got like Long Beach and in the baby blue area, that's, that's LAPD. So those are some pretty big agencies in Glendale. So the, the, the nice thing is that what we do is that elder and real estate and fraud, we do communicate with each other. Because if we didn't, could you imagine if everybody knew how this worked, they could just be skirting in and out of all the different jurisdictions and nobody would know what's going on. So it's really important that we talk. So we meet on real estate once a month and we meet weekly on forensic uh, for the elder. Let me just, just move the groundwork here. And then, so let me, uh, then I'll, I'll move along and show you how we do that with the elder, the forensic center. So here's my couple, they're saying hello, and uh, they're, gonna, they're gonna show you uh, some many faces of, of elder fraud, but there's other faces uh, under the same guise of elder fraud, what we call dependent adult uh, uh, also. And we're gonna ask you some questions to test your knowledge here. So what is an elder? Can anybody tell me what is an elder in the state of California? Anybody over 60? 65. Okay. I know AARP actually started sending me stuff a little bit early. I hadn't turned 60 yet, and I was getting, I got one today. They can't wait to get me. I'm 61. Sorry, but I see the shirt. Yeah. I know. So, and I've already got, uh, I've already been getting certain places I go. They ask me, are you a senior when I sit down to eat? It's pretty nice, Denny's, you know. Okay. So, an elder is, we agree, 65, right? So, what is a dependent adult? Can anybody tell me what a dependent adult is? We're talking generically for, for criminal. Somebody who needs assistance. That's a good one. That's one of them. What else? Somebody needs assistance. How about the age groups? 18 Anybody? Or over. 18 or over. And what age, up to what age? So you die. 65. 65. Very good. So dependent is up to 60, because 65 is then the elder, right? right? So if I was 17 and I entered into a contract to buy a car, and the car turned out to be a lemon, and I took it back to the lot, and I said, I don't like this, and the guy says, sorry, you bought it, and we went to court, and the judge says, okay, how old are you, son? 17. And, the, and he says, well, he signed a contract. Is the contract valid? No. no. Why? Under the law of contracts. Okay, He's because the age of he has. So, when we talk about elders then, and dependent adults, we talk about everything that's above 18, okay. So if I t walked out here tonight, I got in an automobile accident, and I ended up in the hospital admitted, and I am now in a 24-hour care center, do I become a dependent adult? Yes, I do. What was your scenario again? I'm, I walk out, I get in an automobile accident, right. and I'm admitted to a hospital, and I am now under a doctor's care. Am I a dependent adult? Yes, I am. Yeah, sure. Yes, I am. And a lot of patients in hospitals become victims in hospital settings. So we get a lot of people that we get contacted. They've been contacted by somebody in the hospital that's kind of maybe taking advantage of them for many reasons because they are maybe getting morphine or some kind of opioid and they don't really understand what's going on. But they are a dependent adult. And if somebody came in and wanted to say, sign away my real estate and I am morph got morphine drip, do I really know what's going on? No, and we're going to talk more about that. We're going to lay a lot of groundwork before I really start getting into questions and answers, okay? So, a dependent adult, to recap, and anybody that gets admitted to a 24-hour facility. So there's many faces of elder abuse and dependent adult abuse in the penal code sections in California, which we'll, we'll look at briefly. But I want you to see, it's not just because I'm using a walker, it's not just because I'm uh, 75. It can be I, I'm in a wheelchair. It could be that I've got different capacity issues, okay? Maybe I've got other medical conditions, too, as, uh, at a young age. So, Hubert Humphrey, anybody know who he was? Yeah. Good, good, good. He was. It's a, once said that the moral test of government is how that government treats those who are in the dawn of life the children, those in the twilight of life, the elderly, and those in the shadows of life, the sick, the needy, and the handicapped. And I like to read that because Hubert Humphrey's way back, right? But has it really changed? No, it hasn't. And tonight, when we talk about fraud, is it really changed? Yeah, we were, asking, we were talking earlier, has fraud really changed? 
the fraud is still there, but the way it's delivered has changed. The audience, the amount of people has changed, so we'll get into that. So, when a lot of people look in the mirror at themselves, what do they see? They see themselves when they're younger. They see themselves the way they still think they look, right? And I, you know, I, I had this problem up till about last year. I kept looking in the mirror and thinking I was still 18. And I said, no, I'm not. So he looks in the mirror, he looks back, he's a chemist. And he looks back and he's, he's getting ready to go out and dance or something. She looks in there and says, I, I'm a nurse. He's looking at when he graduated. And she's just looking, when she was a professional, she looks like she was a professional secretary, okay? So, but that's, that's what the mind visions, okay? And then there's this guy. Anybody know who that is? That's me with brown hair, all right? I, I just quit working. I was, I was assigned to City of Cerritos, and they moved me over to the City of Hawaiian Gardens for a while, and that was me. I was pretty young then, but now look at me. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> so the only thing is I'm not allowed to smoke a cigarette or cigar where I work. We have no smoking provision, so I can't you know, kick back in a chair like that. But I do have a, a desk like that where I sit now, right? And I kind of, hi, just like that. What do you want to talk about? So, all right, so what does not change? We find the lies. Our detectives are trained to find the lies, and that's really important. We follow the money, and money is, well, money is many things, and we catch the crooks. But if I was to ask you, what is money? What is money? Anything liquid? So, so, so water is money? No, cash. Okay, so cash is a form of money. Of all the assets. Okay, so I've got currency and cash. What else could be money or considered valuable? Yes. Something that's important to somebody. So how about a narcotics user? What do you think is important to a narcotics user? Drugs, right? How about to a terrorist? What's important to a terrorist? Ammunition, guns. Guns, ammunition, intel, right? Whatever they need to do whatever their mission is. How about organized crime? What is organized crime? What is something that's important to organized crime? Drugs. What else? Power. power. Power is huge in organized crime. Think of the Godfather. Think of the structure. Think of all the people that owe favors. Think of all the things that go on in that movie. Power. So money, it can, it, how about Fred Flintstone? What was money to Fred Flintstone? Uh, a, rock. a rock. A boulder, right? And yabba dabba do, and off with Barney Rubble, right? So that's what we do. So money can be whatever's valuable or something to somebody else, okay? So we don't get hung up on money, okay, per se. So our initial response to a new case, and, and I'm, I'm sure, I mean, it hasn't changed, right, Jackie? We stop the activity. We have to stop the activity. That's our primary thing. Before we even start digging into what's going, you know, who did what, we need to stop it, and that'll be kind of repeated over and over, because we've got to protect the vulnerable adult or the dependent adult. We have to do that. That's the first thing. We want to stop the bleeding. Then we start assessing the crime. So here, here's your initial deputy that comes to your house, and he's doing these things. He's, he's either he's going, oh my gosh, what do I, I've got to stop the activity. I've got to protect them. And I've got, to, what kind of crime do I have? Well, I better do some interviewing. I've, oh my gosh, what's capacity? Does this person really understand what I'm saying? Do they know what I'm talking about? That's capacity. And interpreting and collecting documents. They're talking about all these documents and deeds and, oh my gosh, what is all this stuff? I gotta write it all up in a report and, and get it written and give it to the detectives. They know what they're doing. I gotta get rid of this, right? Notification to Adult Protective Service. Who is that? Anybody know? Anybody ever dealt with? Yes, they are. And I, if, you, if you were able, uh, these are really good things to have around. You call this number, anybody can call, you're anonymous, you see something going on, you call that number, they make a report, and they have to respond, and law enforcement that's in that jurisdiction where they are have to respond. So this is how we find a lot of things going on when people call this number and make a report over the phone. It's really important. So that's called Adult Protective Services. They fill out a form called the SOC 341, which is kind of just technical jargon. And then resources for the victim. So they don't know, you know, oh, they don't let it happen again. Or who do I call? You know, oh my gosh, thank you for helping me this time. But next time, who do I call? So that's what a lot of these pamphlets are for. We, all the deputies that come out, they carry these things. Good question. Adult 
protective services, does it matter what county it's in? Every county has a form of adult protective services. And it may be called something different, but they have it. But if, if, they, if you call for something that's happening in Orange County, let's say you call LA County, and you say, I think it's happening in Santa Ana, then they may transfer you to or tell you to call Orange County. But do they follow the same type of criteria? Yes, and follow yes the they same do. Kind of rules or yes, they do. The SOC 341 is a state form, and it, it dictates what we have to do as mandated reporters. All right. So who commits these crimes? We've got professional crooks out there that love to do these things. They really prey upon people. Um, and then we've got family members. Believe it or not, I would say, what percentage do you think our family members in our cases. Very high. very high. Very, very high. It's unfortunate. It can be siblings, it can be daughters, sons, it can be aunts that are living out, of, I mean, uncles. It, you would not believe all the people that can be involved in the family member uh, uh, part of this crime. And then caregivers. We have a lot of caregivers that, that unfortunately get in, they get, they get trusted, and they eventually will take advantage. And then friends and neighbors. So you have to kind of be cautious. You know, I live on a street where a lot of elderly people live. And, you know, of course, they know who I am. They know who my wife is. Hey, come on down. We really appreciate you guys helping us. You know, we'd love to have you take this. No, that's okay. Because say something happens, and we've had this, and then the relatives come in. They go, what happened to Grandma's plates? What happened to Grandma's vase? Well, we've got to be very careful. Be careful what you accept, okay? So... Possible indicators of financial abuse. Can anybody tell me in here what you think? Just tell me, real simple, what do you think a possible indicator of financial abuse would be? Loss of uh, money in your bank account. Very good. That's one, the number one, loss of money. So now we have, someone else has to answer. Anybody else? Give me one. He got the easy one. Let's start thinking about documents. Let's start thinking about the home. What are some other indicators that things are, or things are not going right? Think of your neighbors, if you have somebody that's elderly. What would cause them maybe, and your radar would go up and say, something's not right. The house isn't being kept up. What's that? The house isn't being kept up. Oh, that's another one. House is kind of not being kept up. Things are kind of, things are kind of falling off, right? What else? You had another one? Not even the property tax. That's another one because money's being diverted. So some of the things that are supposed to be done. But then we're going to get into some other areas with, with power of attorney and other people are supposed to be maybe doing that. We don't have too many caregivers we like, depending on their relationship, family or professional, doing that uh, area. What else? But for sale well, for sales signed, yeah, that could be one. So let me. People coming in and out of the house. Yes, a lot of people coming and going. Things may be getting moved in and out. Uh, maybe someone says, a family member comes over and knocks on your door and says, hey, you know, who's this person watching my dad? And, you know, I noticed the will and everything's missing, or it's all been changed. Is that an indicator? Yeah, so let's take a look here. So we've got isolation. We see this a lot. Uh, we've had actual people will move into a house and they will isolate the elder to one area of the house and not let them out. We'll have recent changes to the will, living trust or power of attorney, which is, we'll get into a little more about power of attorney. Lack of knowledge regarding their finances, which we've covered, and unusual banking activity. We start seeing somebody go into the bank that maybe went down once a week to get $20 and now he's got a young girlfriend. He's 85, 90. She's 20, and now he's withdrawing $500 a day. That's a problem if it's unauthorized, and maybe there's a capacity issue. So a lot of times we get called for that. We have unusual concern by the caregiver all of a sudden about the money being spent. It's not their job. They just need to worry about what their job is. Now they're worrying about the fact that we're spending maybe too much money. Unpaid bills, which we said, and then we have capacity deficiencies. Lack of cooperation by an elder. If I was living a home and I'm an elder, what would be one of my biggest fears? Falling, yes, and nobody's around. But what would be one of my big fears if I like my house and I like my animals and I like my garden and I like my TV? What am I worried about? Being removed. Being removed. Being removed. And why do people get removed? What happens? Maybe capacity. Maybe what else? They get duped into signing something that they didn't know. Right. Really, uh, so maybe a family member says, maybe we shouldn't uh, allow you to live alone, so we maybe have to put you in a home. That's one of the big fears. That's why they don't always want to call us. Or give, give the general power of attorney and I'll take care of all your assets. Right. So, 
Fear of embarrassment. That's another one. I don't want to be embarrassed. You know, we've even had where people befriend the suspect and say, I like the suspect. That person's the only person that's paid attention to me in 20 years. All right, so that happens. So we have an elder may be embarrassed. There it is. Look at that. They may fear their independence being taken away, being placed in a home, and they'll lose the attention of the suspect. Elder and dependent adult abuse. We have to do, well, we talked about in the very beginning. We need to first off find out if they fall into what we call elder abuse or dependent adult. So we do that by determining the age of the victim at the time of the offense. And that becomes important if you're helping your neighbor like I was a few, a lot, what, two weeks ago, and they're at my door. And of course I know my neighbor's age. I know what, you know, there's no question there. But somebody's telling me about something that's going on, and I need to know, is this, was this 10 years ago? And how old were they 10 years ago? Because if they're not 65, is it, is it elder abuse? No, it's just a theft, maybe, right? But it could be an elder if they were 65 plus, right? Or a dependent adult. So we have to always know the age at the time of the offense. We try to determine the suspect's relationship with the victim. Are they a child, a relative, or a caregiver? Is the, villain, is the victim willing to prosecute? And this is a big one. We have a lot of parents that get duped by their sons and daughters. And then they go, you know, I really like my, my son, though, and he's having a hard time, and I know he's a narcotics user, but you know what? I don't want him to go to jail. I'm not going to prosecute. And so that just allows that to perpetuate. So we have to get involved there. We have to consider the mental capacity. And is there a power of attorney or conservatorship, which we're going to talk about a little bit. So what doesn't change is right on the screen again. We just we're going to go right back to where we start. We've got to figure out what's going on. So... Like I said, we triage, we protect the victim, and we stop the ongoing crime. Everybody good with that? Number one priority, right? Remove, move the suspect, remove the danger, right? So here's the laws. We really, in our world, the way things are going now with a lot of the laws that got changed in the last two elections, grand theft and a lot of the laws we used to use have been made wobblers or not really charged as felonies anymore. So people are not going to prison. They're going to state, or they're going to county, and they're doing less time. They've changed a lot of the laws. There is one or two laws that are important in fraud that did not change. One of them is identity theft. Identity theft did remain as a felony, and that's important because it comes into a lot of things we talk about. But the other one that's very paramount is elder fraud. Elder financial or abuse are still felonies, and they have not been changed. So if I steal money in the state of California, to be charged with a felony for stealing money, does anybody know the dollar value I have to steal? Now, $950. If I'm an elder and, I, and you steal from me and you take $200, does it matter? Do you think? It's a felony. Doesn't matter what the amount is, it is a straight felony, okay? We actually are, or we, we actually have something going through the court right now, which we kind of tested that, but it is. So if we can show a pattern or, and, and there's a reason for it, and you'll see it. Because people rely on people that are caregivers. People, people that are elderly, they're vulnerable. They should be protected. They don't have always the capacity to know what's going on. So we have these sections, the, and I'm just going to put them up to, so you understand. We deal with what we call 368, which is a penal code, which talks about physical uh, abuse. And then we have 368D, which talks about forgery, fraud, theft, embezzlement. So we have these two sections which are really our cornerstone in dealing with what we do in fraud, okay, and, and elder abuse, okay? And I just put them up there so you know. There are a lot of other sections like you brought up, ma'am, forgery, embezzlement, theft, and all those different things, but we don't really concern ourselves as much as we do with this. A lot of times we could have a bunch of other charges, but guess which one we really want if it's there? that one. If there was 100 charges and I had a choice to pick one, that's the one I take because they're going to go to prison on that one. Okay? It doesn't change. So we look for that. So it's a civil matter. Anybody ever heard that? Don't worry about it. It's civil. We don't, uh, don't worry about it. Just to go to small claims or get an go attorney and go to court. It's not, true. it's not true. They can have civil and you can have criminal going on at the same time. Okay? Especially in real estate cases and other cases. There, you could have both prongs going on. And we tell people, especially in real estate, make sure you get to seek the advice of a civil attorney in addition to the report you have made about the criminal allegation. Okay? So don't let anybody fool you and tell you it's civil if you believe it's criminal. Okay? It may be criminal and civil. Both. Okay? So, 
We have common documents, and just because they're called civil documents, it don't assume it's a civil case, okay? So we have all these docs, and we're gonna, we're gonna kinda look at some of them. We have common docs called wills, trusts, power of attorney, letters of conservatorship, private contracts, life contracts, care, con care contract. None of these are licensed to steal. So when we see these, and we talk to our people, and we start getting these explanations to us about what they believe they can do, we go, wait a minute, time out. It doesn't mean you can steal, all right? Okay, you went ahead and you bought somebody that's 90 years old a Mercedes so they can, you can take them to the doctor. Did you really need to buy a Mercedes Benz to take them to the doctor? No. no. So we have to look at what is really happening here. We, we have $500 worth of groceries being bought a week for somebody that's 90 years old. Does that sound reasonable? No. no. We have all kinds of other things which we'll hit. So that's what we look for. We look for what we know is basic, and we look at what's excessive. Okay. So, so as you can see, as a detective, can it be a mind-boggling thing? It's a lot of paper. And these cases really get huge. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to Ed come up here, Ed, uh, Ed Navarro. And I want him to really talk, or, or if any, if you, well, ask them. What, what, ask the audience what they think a will is. Well, before we do that, let's take a step back. What would you call my autos, my real property, my tool collection, every part of personal property, real property that I own? What would you call that? Assets. Assets. Another word for an asset would be? Things you own. My estate. estate. Exactly. Now, we all have a plan for our estate when we pass on. The question is, do we take an active role in writing that plan? So you have several options. You have what's called a, anybody else? Living will. Living will is one. Or, or a trust. Living trust, right. What happens when you pass on and you don't have either? You die in Thank you. You die in testing. And now your will becomes the uh, probate code and on the rules and uh, regulations under the distribution of your estate. That becomes your will. So you ask yourself, what's the biggest difference between uh, a will and a living trust? Well, one has probate, one does not. Right. When it, one can go out and avoid the probate. Another key aspect is key. privacy. Oh, privacy, yeah, it, it becomes public information. What one is private, the other one isn't. Now, for simplistic purposes, I look at it this way. Your living trust are your wishes while you're alive, which can be made changes to. They, they are effective then and there when it's created. And your will becomes effective when? When you pass on. I'm sorry? When you're incapacitated to make a decision. Then you're going to have a, care, a form of guardianship or conservatorship, depending on your age. Below a minor, it's going to be guardianship. Over 18, it's going to be conservatorship. Now, that being said, let me ask by a show of hands. Anybody here have a living trust? Good. Congratulations. Let me ask this next question. When was the last time you updated that living trust? We view it at least eight, every 18 months. Things change. You know how many cases we have that involve a living trust that has real property and we get a copy of the living trust and lo and behold, that living trust does not address that house that recently purchased? It's not included. They fail to add it. They fail to add it to the living trust. But prior to that, one of the bigger problems is this. Locating it. That is our first problem that we need to overcome. Location. We have an heir, a sibling, someone who comes in and says, files a report. Okay, where's the living trust at? We have family members that come in and they'll tell us they've all got different copies of the trust. <laughs> and this one trumps that one, and that one was fraud, and that one was this. And we'll, someone will say, well, there is another one, but we don't know where it's at. So where, it, 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 well, I mean, Ed, what would be the suggestion for people with a trust would be to maybe tell your family where your trust is, right? Or is it with an attorney or, or something, right? Duplicate, if not triplicate redundancy. 
Yes. And you talk to your successor trustees. If you have more than one, talk to them. Tell them, look, this is my plan. This is where my safety deposit box is located. This is where the information's at. But it's been true that a legitimate one is notarized, and one that isn't notarized isn't necessarily legitimate. If it's notarized, then it's a legitimate notary. It, when you have a living trust, living trust is basically your wishes as when you're alive. You write it down, it gets signed, it gets notarized. What's stopping somebody from cloning it? Cloning it? Hijacking it. Taking it over. In this day and age. Your incapacity to understand what you did. Well, I'm not sure I understand the question. Basically is this, is that we've had a few cases where living trusts are being hijacked. And what I mean by that is this, we have a property that's vacant. Oh. It's been sitting there for a while. The creator of the trust has passed on. Now his heirs are in the process of distributing it. Well, lo and behold, here comes suspect number one, realizing house is available, looks up the real property and says, hey, look, here's the name of the living trust. Gets online, creates a living trust, names themselves as the successor trustee, and purports to sell the property. And you're saying it forges the notarization? Well, you're notarizing your own document. I mean, the possibilities are, are endless. And we see all of them. We, we, we sit and talk about twists upon twists, and that's what fraud is. Fraud morphs and twists and compounds itself. And sometimes we sit and try to figure out what is the solution? Where are we going with this? And that's what we start talking about, because we've seen a lot of different things. The key is communication. You have to talk to your heirs yes. and express your wishes. I know it's a hard subject to have in certain cases. I mean, even in my own family, it touches me to sit there and talk to my father and my mother and have them discuss their wishes because I don't want to accept the fact that someday they might pass on. It hurts too much. So I look at the screen here, we got power of attorney. Let's talk about this is now where we, we've got these things in place and nobody can really start changing because capacity maybe has changed. So we, we really can't change now. Maybe we don't understand what's being changed, right? So maybe we've got someone now that comes in what we call a power of attorney. What is a power of attorney? on your behalf and it can be many different ones it could be very limited it could be general health care financial full power of attorney springing in the event of something happening but let me ask you when does a power of attorney cease when someone passes on and we've had people think that they can keep being a power of attorney after they pass because once somebody passes and if there's no will or no wishes or something in a trust what happens to the estate? What then happens? What do we call that process? Probate. Probate. Very good, very good. So, we also have conservatorship. Now, sometimes people can't make decisions anymore, right? So we have to find someone that's going to get the power. And this is, a lot of times families have a pop problem with this. Who is going to be the one that makes a lot of the, th uh, the, the necessary decisions? And there's got to be trust. There's got to be a lot of things. So that's what we mean by when somebody's conserved. And it's through a probate court, and it has to be handled uh, through a court action. Does anybody know anybody that's conserved? Usually it's a family member or somebody that they trust or know. <coughs> If they don't know a person, or there's no family, there's a lot of people that are living right now that have no family. We have, we'll go up and we'll say, is there any family? None. So what happens then to help that person? Who, what, what do we call that person then? The, there's an office that helps people with that. If they're not conserved, they're called what? Anybody know? Yeah, that's a court decision, but it's, it's a certain other term we use. Anybody know? It's called guardianship. The Office of the Public Guardian takes over and appoints somebody to do it for you, okay? And then we have contracts. I mean, Ed, we've seen different things. We've seen deeds that spring in the event of this and that, too. I mean, very different types of things, what we'll call life, uh, life estate deeds. And we have contracts that allow people to say, hey, in the event of this, this is what I want. And as long as everybody's in agreement and the people making the decisions to do it and the person that's doing it has capacity, it can happen. It's not a big issue. We agree? Right. We've had yeah. life estates where people agree to, I will deed my property over. 
you will pay the mortgage, you will pay the taxes, yeah. and the day I pass on, it's yours. And it's my thing. It's a life estate. It's a life estate. Right. A life estate. A life estate. We don't see too many of them, but they do every now and then come in and we get asked about them. You know, maybe family members that don't understand them because it's going to someone or maybe a pet or a rock. Years, you know? ago, <laughs> years ago, many of the colleges would do that. Yes. Would uh, want to gain property. They'd go on and they tell a neighbor, I'd like to buy your property. I'll give it to you as a life estate. You can live in it. You can own it. Yeah, I'm sorry. You can live in it. You can use it. But the day you pass on, it comes to us. To the, to the so college. So they sell their property under a life estate, in which they sell it and it becomes effective when they pass on. They'll still be living in the property, using it as if they're, it's their own. But when they pass on, it goes on to that entity. Colleges would use that to gain real property next to their locations. Yeah. They want another frat house. Here you go. Another fraternity. This is how they would uh, get access to that property. <laughs> So we're going to go in now a little bit on a, what we call assessing capacity, and that's, that's how we function and how we look at things. If we're able to rationally make decisions and understand, you know, what's good and bad and if we're going to get hurt or, you know, harmed in any way. So uh, assessing capacity is, is pretty simple. It, you know, there's the people that professionally do it actually have number scales and they sit down and they do all kinds of diagrams and they say, you know, and they, they, they put the number together along with other things with doctor's reports and all that. And they try to assess capacity. A lot of times ours can be very simple. We, we, we will ask like, well, what day is this? You know, what, what, you know, how, who's the president? What city are we in? You can tell a lot by those simple questions. So once we kind of assess that, we might say, you know what, uh, there may be a capacity issue because they're not really answering the questions the way we think they should. So then we start looking at a set, uh, the capacity. So when you believe they have capacity and something's going on with, let's say, I sign away, I'm 80 years old, and I decide I want to sign my deed and give my house to somebody that's 20 years old, and she says she loves me, and I, I love her friendship, and I want her to have it, and I've got full capacity. Can I do that? Yes. If yeah. you... So if you believe they got capacity, they can do what they want. Okay. But guess what? They don't have capacity. What happens? Okay. So in a normal case, everything takes a turn. In a normal case, we have a crime. Okay. <laughs> Nine one one gets called. Police respond. Here they come. The suspect's arrested. They go to jail. They get booked. A report gets written. Pretty important. District attorney gets involved, right? Or investigators. Actually, these are specialized investigators. Like, this would be like elder fraud investigators, OK? I always mess that up. CSI might even get involved, depending on what kind of crime. Maybe we've got specialized crime. And then we've got a district attorney. There's Jack, OK? And he's smiling. And then we've got judge, Judge Judy, okay. And the judge says, hey, guess what? You're going to jail, right? And the law is upheld, and the American way of life is upheld. So that's kind of the normal process, but what happens when they don't have capacity? Well, what's missing? That's when we start saying, guess what? What's going on? The investigator maybe did an assessment and said, I don't think something's right here. I don't think this person really knew when they signed away their property what was going on. There's probably a, maybe a crime here. I should write something. I need to notify APS. I need to do the proper thing. And that's what we try to train to our deputies, okay? We need to look at medical records. We need to look at existing capacity declarations. What's been put in place already by doctors? Maybe someone's already said 15 years ago, the onset is starting. Right? We need to find all that. And was that doctor qualified to say that? Are they just a GP? Are they, you know, we don't know what kind of a doctor. There are specialized doctors. And maybe we get the LA County Elder Abuse Forensic Center involved, which he, she, uh, Jackie attends weekly. And the cases come in. And all the people from the different disciplines sit in the same room. And we go case by case. It's all confidential. And when they're all done, a plan is made. A plan that says, this is what we're going to do. Deputy, detective, you're going to do this. APS, you're going to do this. District attorney, you're going to do this. And we're going to get this person assessed by a neuropsych and see what their capacity is. That's the way we do it 
in LA County and Orange County, okay? And do we need an exam? So we have the Forensic Center and we make an appointment. We actually sit on it weekly. We actually attend it. We're part of that group. And we have in that room a lot of different people. I mean, look at all the district, from the district attorney, LAPD, the city attorney. You've got uh, all these different doctors, legal, uh, legal aid. We, we, and this organization has helped us get homes back to an elder, uh, restored because of things that have happened. They're very good. Um, so there's a lot of people involved, okay? Then I got the scam alert, which you kind of jumped me on earlier, so I'm gonna get you now. Here we go. We have the golden rule. If it sounds too good to be true, it is, right? Okay, so we've got a lot of things. How many here believe there's a Canadian lottery? Okay. I got the Royal Bank of Nigeria, you know? I, I, I want to send you this money. I have found it, and I want, I'm telling you, I'm calling you, sending you a fax, an email, and I want you to give me your bank account so I can send you the millions of dollars. Do you believe that? But there's a lot of people that do, and they give them their account number, and they start saying, okay, you know, I need a little bit of help to get it out of the country, and instead of saying, why don't you just take it out of all the money you found, people start sending them money. There's all different twists to these scams, okay? Then we've got all these, these sweepstakes, and they come in, and they look really official, like this one. Comes in a nice tube, it's got all these like seals on it, certificate, seven million dollars. You've won seven million. It's yours, okay? All you gotta do is pay the taxes for process, okay? So it's gonna t I need like 20,000 to process this. Instead of saying, take it out of my winnings, people send the 20,000. And then they say, we need more and we need more, and they never get ahead. They keep going backwards, okay? Well, Paul, your grandson has been arrested in Mexico and he's yeah. to get out of uh, Yeah, Germany. happens, that, one's, that was pretty big. That's, I think that's my next slide. Um, and actually that, that process is, what they'll do is they'll say, please send us a, a money order, or, they'll, or buy some cards and give us the codes in the back and for the, my bail. And then the next time they call, it's for what? my attorney costs because I got to go to court. What I tell people and my relatives when they call me and tell me that they're believing the same scam, which they did two years ago, um, I tell them, okay, when they call and tell you that supposedly somebody that you know, a relative's in jail, then ask them what's the, what's the county jail they're in and what's their booking number. And, you know, and so I can call and check. And when you do that, they're going to hang up. And that's what happened, all right? You need to check. I mean, if somebody tells you you've got a nephew or somebody, that you need to call and verify that before you go send it any money, folks. And if you hear anybody talking about doing that, you need to tell them to stop, take a deep breath, and say, wait a minute, I need to call and make sure my nephew's really in Canada or Mexico or wherever, okay? Now we've got sweetheart scams. I'm gonna tell you, and, and one of them was right in this city, uh, the, 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 the older uh, gentleman, the younger girl, uh, she's befriended, the relatives come in, we don't like this, he's definitely kind of quasi still got capacity, leave me alone. We tell him, hey, we get, the family puts a restraining order, they, they do everything they can to, to get distance between these, they keep coming back together. We start noticing a pattern uh, of theft and different things, we do the search warrant, we get into her house, and she's got seven other victims she's doing at the same time, wears different color wigs and the whole thing. That was probably in the paper. You probably saw that a few years ago. And she's quite a, quite a unique individual. But they, they're out there, folks. They are befriending elder, male and female. We've got gang members that are befriending uh, 80, 90-year-old women, telling them they're in love and taking their houses, okay? Be very careful. Sweetheart scams. And we'll go ahead and there's your telemarketers. My grandson's in jail. If somebody calls you and tells you you didn't show up for jury duty, okay. Uh, what do you want? Well, I'm, the, I'm, with the, I'm with the sheriff's department, and you have to go buy some gift cards and give me the codes in the back, or I'm going to come arrest you. We don't do that, folks, okay? We don't do that. We don't come arrest you for not going to jury duty. Uh, we'll probably, if anything, the judge may order us to go get you, and we might do what we call a body attachment, but we're not going to tell you to come pay us, okay? Uh, IRS scams, we've all heard those. They call every day of the week. They still are, you know. I will tell you this, because if you, some of you missed the last one I did. If you're on that getting ready to do your taxes, don't wait. File your taxes, because the longer you wait, someone else could file in your name, 
It doesn't matter what you made or what you did. They will submit it and they will get in place of you and you'll be denied. And then you have to do an affidavit and wait to get your money back after they say the other one's a fraudulent claim. So please do not wait on your IRS because this time of year is really hot and heavy right now. Go to their site. They tell you all about it. The IRS site tells you all about IRS fraud. Jamaican switch. Oh, here we go. This one's a pretty, this one actually was Artesia Cerritos by the Cerritos Mall. We had uh, a lady approached and uh, she's approaching and told, hey, I got a bunch of money. Uh, I don't know what to do. And as they're talking, another lady walks up and says, I got a friend's attorney and they can help us. And you know what? We could all profit from this. That's a lot of money, right? And so they'll go, okay, uh, but we all need to show good faith. So, uh, uh, Gertrude, do you have $10,000 to show good faith? Yeah, it's in my bank account. So they go to the bank, right over here, Gridley, and they take $10,000 out. And they go, well, you know, we need a little bit more. Do you have any jewelry or anything at the house also? She goes, no, no. Luckily, in this case, it's just the $10,000, right? So they, they say, okay, we're going to put it in the blessed bandana, and we're going to go talk to our attorney and come back, and you can hold on to it. We'll, you just hold it. We'll be back. And about two hours later, she's still standing at Gridley, you know, at 183rd, and she's standing there in the hot sun, and somebody rolls up and goes, what's going on? I'm waiting. I'm going to get all this money. Well, let me see that. And this newspaper, folks, all wrapped up. Okay. So that's called a Jamaican switch. That's a Jamaican roll in a lot of times. And they move around the community. I'll leave it up here if you want to look at it. This is an actual case right here. And they move around and they, they, they hit areas and they leave. And uh, they fleece people for money. Uh, we have a gypsy, what we call gypsy home improvement. They'll come in and tell you that your roof's leaking. It's, it's maybe 100 degrees out. They'll go up on the roof. They'll drill a hole in your roof. They'll squirt water through it as you're down below. And they'll go, look, your, water, your roof leaks. And, and, the, and the lady will go, oh my gosh, and they'll go, we can fix that. We can put a special sealant on your roof. It'll be 100000 And while we're at it, we'll take care of it. We'll put reflective, and we'll make your driveway nice. And while they're doing that, someone's going to the house stealing all their stuff or their information for identity theft. So there's a lot of, you've you got to be really careful with these roving groups of people. Caregiver scams, we kind of, we, we've got those going on all the time. You've got to be careful. You know, back when we had the penny saver, anybody remember the penny saver? And I'd ask people, well, how did you get this caregiver? And they go, I found the person in the penny saver. Okay, and, you, and you're coming to me now because they just got your, your mother who has half a million dollars. You just, she just lost a half a million, and you bought a caregiver because she was cheap in the penny saver. Well, you got what you paid for. Okay, so people, really, when you're going to bring a caregiver into your house, you need to vet them and look at them, okay? We're going to talk about real estate, Ned. We, we may have you come in here a little bit uh, because of this, we've got a couple and they're, on, they're sitting on their dream home. And so a lot of people, when we look at houses, we, you know, we think of you know, nice big houses like this. And, and, and some houses, there's a lot of money here. What do you think that house is worth, average, right there? Yeah, probably. It depends where it's at, location, 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 right? But that's probably an expensive home. Okay, so when we're looking at this home, what do you see here? What do you guys see here? A rundown shack. Anybody see anything else? Look at it. It's on land that's probably worth a billion bucks. What else do you see, ma'am? Property. property, land. Oil Hold on. Anybody see anything besides oil, property, or anything else? Look at it. Keep looking at it, folks. It's like it's agriculture. Anybody see anything else that's, that's kind of odd? And this is what real estate's all about. You have to look beyond what you see. You have to go behind and make sure it's not being held up by two by fours at the front. It, it's not some western front. Do anybody see the car? It's the car. Oh, yeah, the car. Yeah. There's a lot of things here in this picture that are going on. So when we talk about real estate, we talk about the complexity and what we see and what we, are, what we don't see. Okay? So we have most documents that are a deed, something called a deed, right? They get uh, signed by the parties involved. They get notarized. The notary stamp is here. That means that they appeared, maybe not together, but they did appear eventually in front of this person who says, yes, they did appear and sign, and that's who they are. They identified themselves as that. Okay? And usually there's a journal and some, some fingerprints, right? Pretty important in, in real estate, right? And that's all well and fine in the normal, but what if, what if this person right here, Maria, doesn't have capacity? She doesn't know what she's signing. Could that be a crime? Yeah, it could be. Yeah, it could be. So in the real estate arena, we've got a lot of players. So we tell deputies, please, when you're doing a report, 
don't get eager to go out and start running the notary and go door knock the notary because when you spring the web, everybody starts talking and everybody gets worried. Oh my gosh, is there something wrong? So our biggest concern about these kind of cases is that somebody's going to start destroying evidence. So we try to tell people, just make your report and let us do the investigation. We'll ask you some questions. We may interview you again, but we don't want anybody taking independent action on their own. So does it change what we're talking about? Nah. But look at this, what we find in a search warrant. And this is why working with other agencies is really good in communicating. They do a search warrant, and they find a bunch of paper that's got signatures pr being practiced on it and some addresses. And they say, hey, I think that's over in Dana's area. Have, we need to go get that checked out. So we run over to Bellflower, and guess what we find? The, the person that lived there had a stroke and is living now out in Little Rock at his sister's house. And he hasn't been there for three years. People have moved in, taken over his house, took all his possessions and got rid of them, and sold the house, took over, put a deed in their name, like he had signed it, and then sold the house under. Happens, folks. When your neighbors are not around, or they go to the hospital, or something happens, and the lawn gets up to here, and things are not right, and you see people coming and going, you need to call. You need to call us to look at it, or you need to call APS. You need to start a trail of somebody saying, there's something wrong here. Please. That's the reason. This led to somebody being identified, and actually this case is well, it's been almost five years going now. We're finally in court on this one. We're probably going to get resolution next week, I think, on this one. Um, and this actually, home was restored. Um, but the actual forged signature on the deed, home was restored. We had to go through an action with the legal aid, and they actually could not give him his home back. You know that once you sell the house and the, pe the people that buy it in good faith believe it, you can't take the house back. But guess what covers that to the victim that maybe got victimized? What kicks in and maybe compensates them? What do we call that? Anybody know? What kind of insurance? What kind of insurance? If we're doing things right in real estate, we usually have what kind of insurance? Well, title insurance. Title insurance. Yeah, title insurance here compensated the man. Okay. Reverse mortgages. Ed, what do you think about reverse mortgages? Ask, what do you think? It's an option. It might not fit your situation, but it's an option that you may have. Look into it. Explore it. Investigate it. Understand it. Right. And in some cases, it might fit you. And it'll probably work out for the best for you and your family. I mean, the plain simple concept of a reverse mortgage is for you to have your final years in comfort. You have a house that's been paid off. You have a mountain of equity. You don't want to sell it. You want to stay there. What can you do? <coughs> Look into reverse mortgage. And if it fits you and if it benefits you, by all means, take advantage of it. It's there. And if you're gone for more than a year, there's conditions you've got to watch out for uh, that the bank can then step in. You'd re you have to make sure you really know. A lot of times people get fooled here. A caregiver or a family member will, will do the video or they'll do the interview with HUD. HUD is the federal agency that kind of regulates reverse mortgages. And they do those over the phone. So is it easy to dupe somebody through a phone call? Do you really know who's on the other end? They had an interview. Oh, well, does anybody know who the interview was really with? Or was that person being coached? Or were they being unduly influenced? There's a lot of things we have in reverse mortgages. We, a lot of our reverse mortgages is not really always the process, though. It's unfortunately the money that they got and the stealing by the family or the caregiver after they get it. Because it can come in segments or it can come in lump sums, right? So there's a lot of concern about reverse mortgages. You really have to understand them before you get into them. We have builder buyouts and investments. Folks, if you're getting up there in the years, you probably don't want to be getting involved in this kind of stuff because these things take long term. You really need to know what's going on. You need to vet them. You need to understand if they're really supposed to be doing these things and they're legit. Uh, selling annuities to somebody that's 90 years old, that's a waste of, I mean, that's, that's a fraud clear out. And you'll see that in this book that talks all about annuity fraud. It's pretty important to understand. But really, you've you got to be careful when people start telling you, okay, we're going to get you into this investment, and then we'll do the rollover and get you in another one and another and you never get what you're promised. So be very careful with these. And then we've got this gentleman, um, Lincoln Savings. Always remember the weak, meek, and ignorant are always good targets. Nice guy, huh? Nice guy. 
Yeah. Anybody know who that is? Keating. Keating. Yeah. Yeah. So here we go. Uh, here's the number. I, I, I had the little th things. I got the pamphlets. This number's in there. That's the number you call if you've got a problem. Ta they'll, take your they'll take your complaint. And if you don't call us, they'll take it and they'll send us. Okay? Mandated reporters. Just a wrap. Who do you think a mandated reporter is? Who's in a position that they have to report when something happens that they think is suspicious for an elder? Medical. Medical. What else? Teacher. Teachers. Clergy. Clergy. Anybody else? Peace oh my gosh. Oh, I feel like I'm on, on the voice. Pick me. Yeah. Doctors, nurses, psychologists, caregivers, protection. You know, I, I, they're not mandated. No, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some statistics. I don't have a lot, but I just want you to think about these. Look at this, folks. 1980, 90, 2000, 2010. Look at the progression of how many Americans 65 years and older, according to the Census Bureau. What do you think 2020 is going to be? Where are we going here, folks? Forty-five, forty-eight, fifty. We're jumping, and look at how many are hitting a hundred. Seventy thousand as of nine one two thousand ten. The next question below, which you can't see, is says how many are going to hit one hundred fifty? <laughs> Seriously, it's coming. So, how about L.A. County and us? Oh my gosh, L.A. County. We are ten point nine percent of the elder population right here in L.A. County. Okay, for California. Okay, but how about the nation? What do you think? We are 4.23 of all elders, Americans, in the whole country. And okay, so that, look at that. Look at the real estate. Look at all the people here. We've really got to be ready for this because we're getting older and we got more people getting older and we're living longer. We, I mean, we're, we're seeing amazing things going on, technology. But the keys to our success, I like to tout about our successes. We should, right? Because we do great things. I really believe we do. Well, if I told you those were keys to all the victims that were victimized in a real estate fraud, would you believe me? Because that, that was put on the court table by the detective who said, this represents my victims. Boom. What do you think the jury did when they heard that? <gasps> what do you think the response was from the suspect? <gasps> I'm done. Yeah. We do a lot of great partnerships. Uh, if you've ever read anything about us, uh, we had a huge, uh, back when everybody was trying to save their homes, a foreclosure, a rescue, this was up in Pico Rivera. Uh, 500 victims, Spanish speaking, newspaper, or uh, they were using a radio station in the same building to tell people to come down. Next door, they were, were bringing people in with, uh, to bring in money. They had a religious type uh, bring money to us. They had all compartmentalized all these things going on. State bar, they had attorneys involved. We ended up uh, taking those people down and, and taking everything. And it took a few years to put together, but they're in pr they served prison time. Uh, they weren't the only one. We ended up having several others with about the same amount of victims, Bell Gardens, some other cities that we jumped into, because we're part of a task force. So we're able to take these huge cases which a lot of agencies that are very small cannot do financially. They just don't have the manpower. We took it, we started working with other agencies, the Register Recorder now, who we work with, they now have video that we are allowed to, able to use, and we work with them regularly, we meet. We actually said, hey, how could you not videotape when somebody's coming up and recording a deed that anybody can walk in as long as it's notarized on somebody's property that might be worth a million dollars? Oh, maybe a camera would help. At least we can see who it was. I mean, we've had great success with the recorder's office. We have great success with the media and uh, with Spanish television. We, we use anything we can. We, like you saw in the very first thing I showed you, we, 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 uh, we want to get it out. We want to stop it. We want to alert people. If you're a victim, we want more victims. We want to get it and nip it in the bud, right? And then we talk, do a lot of talking, another panel that talks about how do we stop real estate and elder fraud. <coughs> Excuse me. So who are you going to call? Ghostbusters, right? Yeah. So you've got uh, real estate fraud. You've got Sergeant Alex Gillinets, who couldn't be here tonight because he, uh, he's watching two different teams right now. He's up in uh, Antelope Valley, Santa Clarita area right now. And then Jackie's here, of course. And I'm here. And I'm on my way out. 
two months, I retire. I'm finally done, 34 years of total. So, uh, but it's like the mafia, I might get drug back, you know, I don't know. <laughs> Just when you think you're out, you, you get drug back in. Yeah, so make me an offer I can't refuse. And so, and that's our number at the bottom, which is on all the pamphlets. Uh, just real quick, please, if you can, call your family and friends and pass on this information that we've given you here today, everything you've learned. Um, you can help prevent some of this crime out there just by passing this on. You know, the more you pass on, the more, you know, less victims we have, less cases, and uh, we need your help to pass this information on. Thank you. Yes. What if you do report something? Will your department contact that person that made the report and let them know what's going on? Yes, basically when you make a report and a detective will be assigned if there's some workable information and we will contact you as a person who reported the case or the crime. But we also contact other people also because it's part of the investigation.